May I invite you to the book of Acts, which we believe is also written for us by Luke. We believe that Luke, the physician, wrote both books. And uh, the passage that we're going to look at is Acts 9, the ninth chapter. And we'll be using an NIV version, but also we'll jump between some of the other translations just to get more elaboration. Uh, let me invite you when you have opportunity. This is such an important passage in the Word of God. It's, I know you're familiar with it already, but just walk with me tonight if you would. It's what we call as Saul's conversion text. Some would say it's his call text, not a conversion text. And I think actually it's both. Um, but it's not only given to us in Acts, the ninth chapter in the first verse, but there are portions of it that actually add more detail from Acts, the 22nd chapter, as well as Acts 26. So if I happen to refer to something that you don't see in Acts 9, it may just be another ounce of detail that was added in another passage. So let's begin reading, if we might, from Acts, the ninth chapter, verse one, and we will probably read the first seven or eight verses. Uh, and then after that, we won't read a lot. We just kind of want to tell the story. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. This passage reminded me, we'll pause for a moment in our reading, of so many things, and I wanted to share with you the words from a song. Uh, and that song is, we're not going to sing it, but if you would keep it as a backdrop in your mind, and that song is, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And that's exactly what we see happening in the life of Saul. And that song says to us, we haven't sang it in a while, perhaps where you are, it's fallen into the background too, but open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. All right, if you'll just keep that in mind. Now let's walk through this passage. Will you walk with me? Acts the ninth chapter. Meanwhile, well, every word I say is often important when we're reading scripture. And the reason it says meanwhile lets us know that there was something else that was happening as well. This passage follows after great persecution of some of the Hellenistic Jews, the believers, particularly in Jerusalem. And you may recall that Stephen, a faithful disciple, a devout man of God, had been stoned. And while they were murderously stoning Stephen for his faith and his belief and his testimony that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Messiah, Saul, who we sometimes refer to as Paul, his name is later given to us uh, interchangeably, but Saul, as a young man, stood by an observer, giving silent consent. Do you know that often to be silent, to not speak up, is to give consent to violent actions? He stood by silently, but he stood and held the coat of those who picked up the stones and did the deed. Imagine having to take your coat off before you stone someone. It, uh, that's an aside in the scripture, but you see people doing violent things, but they proceed it with some kind of mannerism or courtesy. But nevertheless, Saul stands by, gives his silent consent. He even says in a passage that he voted his approval of Stephen being stoned. So meanwhile, in Jerusalem, 
the Jews who had become believers and followers of Christ were under great persecution, and many of them escaped the city of Jerusalem and went to other places. And one of the places they went was to Damascus. So the meanwhile is letting us know that this is an insertion, that things didn't just start with Acts 9, but there's been a progression of things that are going on, and we need to feel the climate, feel the atmosphere, feel the sense of violence and hatred and division that is existing. So Saul was still, still tells us again that this is a progression. He was still breathing out murderous threats. There's something lost in the NIV. Actually, I prefer the King James there. Uh, and if you'll allow me, I'll give that reading to you. Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. The NIV version kind of makes it concise, but this is too important to just bring it in. We need to have it stretched out. So he is breathing out, or he is breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Interestingly enough, the word that's used there is not a word, the translation says breathing out, but it's my understanding that in the Greek, what really is described is almost a breathing in, which doesn't seem natural, but it's like he's inhaling the fume and the, the violence and the anger that's all around him. He's taking it on the inside. Uh, it's been translated as breathing out, um, but breathing as, as an exercise is inhaling and exhaling, so we don't have to prove that point. We can accept that. And it is though he is snorting like a war horse that smells the steel of the battle. In other words, he is consumed with this internalized uh, fierceness and uh, hatred, as it were, of the believers. So he is still, he has started this beforehand. He's begun it in Jerusalem, but now he is continuing and carrying it out. Do you know how things start uh, a flame of vengeance and violence, but then it begins to be self-perpetuating? It's as though Saul was not content to just see the harm that was done to some believers in Jerusalem. But now he wants to pursue. He's, he's a, one writer calls him a terrorist. I would call him a self-appointed vigilante. I don't know if that's the right form of the word, like a one-man militia, except he doesn't have an automatic weapon. And he's not content to stay where he is, but he goes into another territory with that same vengeance. And now he's leaving Jerusalem, and he's going to go to Damascus, which is about a six-day or a week's journey walking, approximately 135 miles a bit to the north. I think we have a map. A map may not be of the exact uh, time that we're looking at. We're, the map that we have is, is an earlier map, but if you can see that, uh, above that lower pink area down at the bottom, um, I need to see it, is Damascus. I'm not seeing it from here, but it's there. And Dema there it is. Damascus is about halfway up. And Jerusalem um, is about a third of the distance down. So they're both inland from the coast. And he's leaving Jerusalem and going to Damascus to pursue these disciples. Thank you. And what's important to know is Damascus is one of the oldest cities. Uh, it's part of 10 cities that are prominent cities that are called the Decapolis. And they have been under Roman and Syrian rule. And so he's leaving this place to go to that place. But why is he going? He's going there with these threats against the Lord's disciples. You will find in this passage, as this is a developing faith and it is being spread abroad, that there are different names that are being used to talk about the believers. They'll be called the way. They'll be called disciple. In the course of this chapter and the next, they'll be called followers. They'll be called those that call on the name of the Lord and several other titles. And so it gives you the idea of things, a new language is being developed, new terminology is needed. You, you get the idea that this is a new normal for those who had been committed to Judaism. Now they're finding that some of the Jews have left the old traditions of Moses and they're following the ways that Christ had taught. So they're trying to find how do we negotiate this? How do we relate to these people? What do we think about them? How do we handle them? And the fear was that as they moved out of Jerusalem, obviously running from persecution, that they would spread their faith to new areas. And Saul wanted to make sure that that did not happen. So he was still breathing out these threats, and he went to the high priest. So he went to the one that was in charge in Jerusalem, and he asked for letters to take to the synagogues in Damascus. Now, typically it took about 
uh, I'd say 10 families or groups of 10 to have a synagogue. It's assumed that there were many synagogues, many places of worship in Damascus. And so he's going to the high priest in Jerusalem and saying, I want you to give me authority. In other words, I want some papers to say I have a right to go and assert myself and my rule over these followers and believers. The irony of it is he goes to the high priest to get papers a false authority against the great high priest? Can you imagine how absurd that is? But Saul doesn't see it at this point. And so uh, he's going to do what he's going to do regardless. But he goes saying, and I now have authority to uh, take these people. And the, the, the wording that's used here uh, is not real clear. But the, uh, the implication is he wants to have legal proceedings as well as a judicial punishment. And basically, he's not expecting to exterminate them himself, but he is expecting to uh, see to an extradition. He wants to capture them. He uses the word in one passage. He wants to bind them, and he wants to bring them back for trial in Jerusalem. And then he wants to be there to endorse their punishment. So he's kind of being uh, an executive branch and a judicial branch, and he's just all out of order. But he thinks he's doing this and will receive the commendation of God for for it. So he went to the high priest. He asked for letters to the synagogues. If he found any, any men or women, it didn't matter to him. It was just after anyone that was of the faith. Now, the fact that it says if does not mean that if there were any people that were there and prevalent. It just means if he was able to uh, contain them, if he was able to locate them, if he was able to, I'll use the word, to capture them. And, and it's important I use the word capture because I didn't give enough credit to this idea of his breathing out threatenings. Um, what's implied in that word is an intent to destroy. What's implied in there is a wild rage, um, like an unloosed, unbridled beast. Um, he is invigorated in this. It's not just a campaign on his part. It's not just something that's a hobby or a side, a passion. But it is taking over. It has overwhelmed him. It has become his life's work, as it were, to put an end to those who would be followers of Christ. So I want you to see someone uh, who has been unleashed in the landscape, given false authority from a high position, a high ruler, to say, yes, go ahead and do what you want to do uh, against these people. And Paul, Saul, rather, he's later called, after chapter 13, he's called Paul, but it's the same person that we're referring to. He takes the letters and he says, if I found any people who belong to the way, the way is one of the names that's used to refer to Christ's followers. It was probably instituted initially as a name to mock or to ridicule believers. But uh, I believe they later um, uh, began to use it themselves. The word Christian comes in in this sequence of texts. And if I'm remembering correctly, Christian is only used as a term about three times in the New Testament. But the way is very instructive for us because these disciples of Christ, these followers, are not just saying we believe in him. Mm, we just sing about he's a way maker. But they understand that there's a way to live. There's a lifestyle. There's a walk. There's a path that they must walk. It is a way that they must go, a way they must conduct themselves, that they are to be involved in obeying the word of God and trusting in the Lord and committing their life and their cares to him and looking for him, looking to him as the Messiah and looking to him as a soon coming Messiah. So because this idea of the Messiah coming soon, because they expected Jesus to return readily, this growing expectation, that just created more and more fervor in the heart of someone like Saul, because there's this growing uh, uh, energy among the believers. He had to be impressed with the fact that they had great stamina. He had to be impressed with the fact that they persisted despite the fact there was persecution. He had to be uh, impressed with the fact that it was a contagious um, faith that was growing despite all of the opposition. And so all of that just fanned the flames of hatred that much more in Saul's life. So he takes the letters and he looks, he doesn't care if it's men or women, and he wants to take them as his prisoners. Isn't that a lot of nerve? Prisoners back to Jerusalem. Now, 
This idea of getting papers from the high priest. There had been a time when there was agreement between Rome and the Sadducees who acted as the high priest um, that they could have a, a great deal of leeway in terms of civic rule. We're not sure at this point how much authority was still given to the Jewish high priest, but it, was, it is assumed, I'll say, that they had some limited but the word would be that they had some titular, in other words, in name only, in title only. They had some authority over their own people when it came to matters of religion. In other words, within your own group, we'll let you make some decisions. So uh, don't think the high priest really had a dominating rule over all the policies and the laws. But within this, you know, within the group, okay, we'll, we'll let you take them back so that you can judge these people and punish them. So as he neared Damascus, and I love this. He was almost there. How many times are plans against the plan of God? And they're almost executed, almost there. Let's put that verse up again. Which verse is that, if I may say? As he neared Damascus, he wasn't there yet, but as he neared this city, this city that sat at the base of a hill, he was almost there, that sat in these green plains, this city of age and a commercial center that was of, of much distinction. He was almost there. So many times the enemy almost got me. There's a scripture where David says, I almost not slipped. I, I almost gave up. I almost turned around. But he said, as he neared Damascus, God stepped in and intervened. Uh, you could say amen right there. And when he intervened, it says he was near Damascus on his journey. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now, you know, there are all kinds of explanations that are given. It happens that Damascus is in an area that is believed to have a lot of electrical storms and thunder. Some say this was lightning, but I don't necessarily, I don't know whether it was lightning or not, but that doesn't impress me as being the miraculous um, that I believe is really the miracle in this text. But it was a light that was a very bright light. When you read in Acts 22 and 26, we believe this was midday that Paul was traveling and this light that shone suddenly that was all around him and not everyone else that it was brighter than the noonday sun. We have just a stock picture that gives us an image. It's obviously not uh, accurate, but let's take a look at the, the graphic that shows Paul, Saul as he's kneeling and this light is around him. It was a blinding light. It was a light that was the light of the glory of God. Get a picture of this. You're just traveling down the road. The scripture says he has companions. We assume that his companions are maybe some temple police and probably some other wayfarers who are just traveling in a group for safety as they travel. And then you're almost to your destination. And there is this stark interruption. God intervenes just like that. He just puts the brakes on stuff that the adversary wants to do. And this light shines and it focuses clearly on Saul. Now, when you read in the ninth chapter, it'll say that Saul fell to the ground. Some will say he fell off his beast. And the light was a blinding light. This was the light of the not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N, the light of Christ. This is the light of the one who says, I am the light of the world. This is the light that shines in darkness. And so what happens is this blinding light shines. Now, some have struggled to harmonize the scriptures because in one case, it says that Saul saw the light and heard the voice. Another scripture describes that they, some saw the light but didn't hear the voice. Uh, and so if you look at the three, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, you get different perspectives. When you actually look at the word that's used in the Greek, I'm not sure the pronunciation, but it's our word phone, P-H-O-N-E, it means that it could be a noise, it could be a sound, or it could be an articulated language. So what seems to be the case is that everyone heard something, but that only Saul was able to comprehend and get the uh, understanding of what the voice was saying. So they all 
exhibited a light because they fell to the ground. The scripture says his companions, after it was over, they got up and they were speechless. They didn't know what to say. They didn't even know what happened. So if it was traumatic for them, imagine what trauma this was for Saul, who was on his way to persecute people, take them captive, self-appointed vigilante, going out of his area to go after these Christians, these innocent people, as it were. And now he is knocked down, pompous, prideful, arrogant, Saul, Saul, the big guy, Saul, who is one who's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's a Pharisee. His father was a Pharisee. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin usually was the tribe that went first in war. I know we talk about Judah go first, but that was an exception. And it was so much so that the tribe of Benjamin had room to be proud until there was a saying that said, after you, Benjamin, uh, meaning the tribe. So he, he had some clout. He had studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He, he was learned. He was achieved. He said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew the Holy Scrolls. He was proficient in the law. He had a razor sharp intellect. He was the man. Do you get this? And now he is on the ground. The pompous is down low. And so we entitled this lesson from hunter to hunted. From hunter, if they have a screen, they can put that up for you. From hunter, the hunter becomes the hunted. Not haunted, like Halloween type haunt, not ghosts, but hunted. And so here is Saul, who's out maliciously with design and intention, hunting the people of God. And now God has hunted him down. I'm saying the word wrong. When I say it twice, I don't pronounce it right, but you get the idea. He, God has hunted him down. And so he was going to arrest others and bind them, but now he's been arrested. He's been arrested by a blinding light. Now, this light is so bright in the midday, siesta time. It was, it was so bright until when he gets up, he can't see. The others are speechless, but he can't see at all. And this loss of his physical sight is a parable for the sightlessness of his spirit. Mm -hmm. You don't think of the spirit as having eyes or the heart as having eyes. But we just looked at some words that said, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. No doubt Saul wanted his natural eyes to be open. But the better plea for him to come to and progress to would be to have the sight of his heart, to have his heart enlightened. So the text is engrossing at this point and engaging. And so this light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. So he goes from high to low. Physically, his position has changed, but not just physically. In terms of what he is doing, in terms of his agenda, in terms of who he is, in terms of his commissioning, it now means nothing. In terms of his direction and his hopes and his plan, all of it is in the ground. All of it, as it were, is not so much on the physical ground, but it's just something to be trodden on. Do you get this? We talk about giants. They have to come down. We talked last couple of weeks ago about walls coming down. Well, these are the plans of men. They come down. These are people who set them up. Self-appointed arrogance falling down. So I don't want you to just read through the story quickly as though he just just fell off his beast or his horse or whatever. But I want you to see those who have set themselves in opposition to a living God, how it is God brings them down. He falls to the ground. He is low from high. He is laid low. And not only is he laid low, but he recognizes there's a voice from heaven and the light is spotlight, flashlight, big heavenly flashlight, huge light is focused, it, focused in on him. Now, he does not know whose voice this is. But he does know it's a voice from heaven. He knows this is not an earthly voice. This is not a high priest voice. This is not a ruler from Jerusalem. Um, he, he, he knows that uh, the Greeks had lots of gods. They had a, a god of this and a god of that and a god of this. They had Iris, who was the god of women and children and medicine. But uh, the Jews had one god, Yahweh. And the Jews believed, it was the rabbinic teaching, that if there was a voice that came from heaven, that it had to be the voice, not of some lesser God, but they believed monotheistic, they believed in one God. 
So any voice that came from heaven, hallelujah, had to be the voice of God. So he wasn't certain uh, exactly, but he knew there was some deity involved. He knew this was a divine encounter. He knew this was a divine collision. Uh, have you had those kind of things? Have you had something that happened that wasn't on your schedule and you just ran smack dab into the will of God? Sometimes it was sicknesses through us there. Sometimes it was something good, a promotion that came there, but it just reoriented everything in our life. It just scrambled things all up. And again, it was an effort to find a new normal because the Jews were trying to deal with these new believers, these Hellenistic Christians, and trying to find what to call them and how to deal with them. And now it's personified in Paul. It's exaggerated in him because he was the epitome of those who was a persecutor. And now the persecutor is going to transition and become the persecuted. Now the one who was the hunter from hunter to hunt, hunt it from Hunter, the one that went after others, is now being hunted, not just by God, who arrest him on this Damascus road. Everything now is based, you know, you ever had a critical event in your life and you, you change your whole calendar? You say, it, it was since this happened. Uh, it was after I moved to Dallas. It was, it was since this change. This now has become the center of what's going on in his life. It's the center of his attention. So he knows that this is a divine encounter and confrontation. And he asked the right question. He says, who are you, Lord? So he says, Lord, because he knows that this, this is not just a person. But he says, who are you? Who could this be? Uh, he's shocked, he's traumatized, uh, he's brought low, um, he's humbled at the very least. And when he says, who are you, Lord? He's asking for the one behind the voice to identify who he is. You look at your Bible and you'll see what I see and it'll make you happy. The voice answers and says what? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul is getting an introduction now. He did not uh, walk with Jesus as the apostles did. He did not eat with Jesus and break bread with him as the apostles did. Uh, he was not his contemporary in that sense, but he is getting a firsthand encounter, a direct message from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the voice says, I am Jesus. Now his whole world is reversed. Everything is flipped upside down because the one he has been criticizing, uh, the, the followers and the people of the way for, is speaking to him. Now there is no question that Jesus is risen. Now there is no question that he did ascend to the Father. Now there is no question that he is yet alive. This turns his whole world upside down. He has given his life, his energy, his passion to refuting the good news of salvation. And now he has direct experience. It's not third party. It's not second hand. The voice says, I am Jesus. So he may not realize the fullness of this because it's, it is a progression again. He comes to know more about this Jesus than just what he's heard. But in this encounter, I believe he develops the elements for what will become his theology that he records later. In this uh, encounter, he learns something about suffering. He learns something about redemption. Redemption. He learns something about the plan of God that cannot be thwarted. He is encountering Jesus, the I am. Oh, you know I am what Moses said. Uh, Moses said, who shall I tell him sent me? And he said, tell him I am that I am. Uh, so let, let's take and dissect this a moment. He calls to him and he says, uh, and you have to look at probably a translation that gives it clear. He calls his name. It's intoned twice. He says, Saul, Saul, you know when your mother called you twice or gave you your whole name, Cynthia Dolores, remember? I knew then, don't try to slip or slide, that's everything, that's my identity. He said, Saul, Saul. And that was a practice that meant this is a formal communication. You're not going to slide through this. This is, this is real business. Remember Abraham? When God called Abraham, he said what? Abraham, Abraham. 
He said, stay your hand. He said, I know now that you love me. You don't have to take your son's life. He was going to take Isaac's life. Moses, Moses. When God spoke to Moses through a burning bush, do you remember that? I'm sure you do. He was letting him know, take off your shoes, take off your sandals. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. When you hear that reverberated, that repetition, God means business. And he does mean business with anyone that comes against the kingdom of God. So he's saying, Saul, Saul, just like he said, Abraham, Abraham, and Moses and Moses. And there were some other examples. There was Elisha. When Elijah was caught up, he began to say, my God, uh, no, he said, my father, my father, as he spoke to the chariots of God. That emphasis was given again. Uh, when Martha was there with the Lord, uh, Jesus spoke to her intimately and personally. And he said, Martha, Martha. And he said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to my father. And when Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? He said, my God, my God. So this, listen, this was not misdirected. This wasn't the fault of somebody's postal system. This was a direct message from the portals of heaven. This was the light of God's glory shining through Jesus Christ. So this must have been the same radiance that was on the Mount of Transfiguration that was brighter than the sun in the sky that arrested the hunter has now become hunted. And so now he is hearing from the one that says, I am. Those I am. The one that he says, I'm the door. I'm the shepherd. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of heaven. Come on. I'm, uh, I am. I am that I am. The I am's of God. The, the seven main I am's. I'm the gate. Uh, this is the one who is speaking to him. In other words, and when that's translated, it's not just that I am that I am, but it is I will be who I will be. In other words, there's no getting around the sovereignty of God. There's no escaping me. You can't can't, you can't be locked into, he's saying to, as it were, to Saul, you can't be locked into your old tradition. You can't be limited to just Moses' understanding. Because Jesus later says to his critics, he says, I, I was before Moses. I'm not saying it very clearly, but the gist of it. He was saying, you say, I'm sorry, not Moses, Abraham. They were saying to him, we're Abraham's children. And he said, listen, before Abraham was, I was. I was here before Abraham. In other words, Abraham acknowledged the the power of God. And he was saying, you really aren't acting like children of Abraham. So there's this intimate, that's very important. There's this personal call. What God has for you is not generic. It's not generalized. It's not something glossed over, but it is specifically, it is personally, it is intimately, it is individualized. It was designed exactly for you. I haven't gotten very far, have I? So Jesus says to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now that goes to exaggerate the personableness of this all. You know, was he putting binds on Jesus? No, Jesus had ascended. But he's saying, when you mess with my people, he's saying, when you persecute the saints, which they're later called in this chapter, when you, when you mess with the people of the way, this Jesus of ours, this God in the flesh, so identifies when you are at a loss, he feels it. When you are in grief or I am grieving, he feels it. When we are hurt, he feels it. When we are bewildered, he's aware of it. Here, this Jesus so identifies with the persecution and the experience of Saul. He's saying that when you, not the persecution of Saul, the persecution that Saul affects. When you persecute my disciples, he's saying you're doing it unto me. Isn't that something? Remember later on, Jesus taught and he said, when you do it unto the least of these, he began to let us know, you know, they said, when did we see you hungry, Lord? When did we see you in jail? When were you, when were you in prison? When were you, when were you hungry? When were you with thirst? And he said, when you do it unto the least of me. Listen, Jesus is so given to us. He is, he is so inviting us to be in him and to make room for him to be in us until it is as if when we are falsely uh, abused and violated for our faith in Jesus Christ. It is as though the arrow or the sword goes through the side of Jesus to get to the believer. Let me say that again. It, 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 we are hid in him. And, uh, and when the believer is persecuted for his name's sake, it is as if the sword or the arrow 
or whatever it is that pierces, it is as though it has to go through the side of Jesus to get to the body of Christ. Ah, he's touched. He's touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And he said, there's no temptation, but, but such as is common to man. We emphasize that divinity side, but we have to remember that he also was human, that he feels, he feels, he wept. Talking about how it was that God would say, Abraham, Abraham, and Moses, Moses, and Martha, Martha. Uh, and how um, that, that emphasis of names, when David was grieving his son, uh, his rebellious son, he said, Absalom, oh, my son, Absalom. When Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem, uh, he called the name twice and said, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. But I want you to know how personal this is. That's why I went back to this point. Jesus also makes a point in a scripture when he says, there's coming a day when people are going to say, Lord, didn't we do, I don't remember exactly what it was, miracles or works in your name. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, I never knew you. They're going to pretend that they know him so well until they're going to say, Lord, Lord. Like he says, Abraham, Abraham, and Moses, Moses, Martha, Martha, and Saul, Saul. They're going to come up with an imitation of intimacy, an imitation of relationship. But you can't fake true relationship. And so he's saying when that day comes and people are going to say what they did in my name and they say, Lord, Lord, they're going to imitate that, that same form of knowledge. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Saul has a personal encounter. There is nothing that takes the place of a personal encounter with God. I remember when I was growing up, they used to always use that terminology. There was something going on in the Star Wars movies at that time. I don't remember exactly what it was. And the preachers would pull that example. But it was this idea of you've got to meet God. And any meeting with God is not casual. Any meeting with God is not routine. Any real meeting of God is not ordinary, but it dates. It sets everything in a different way. And he says, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, and Saul says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus. And he says to him, remember he's gone from the hunter to being hunted. He says to him, get up and go into the city. So if we had a subtitle for today, after saying from hunted to hunter, from hunter to hunted, it would be get up to go in. Get up out of the situation that has held you down. Get up out of the dust that you've not through any fault of your own, perhaps fallen, found yourself falling in. Get up from that low place, that broken place, that hurt place, that wounded, injured place. Get up from that place of humiliation and shame. Get up from that sense of rejection. Get up and go somewhere. You can't go until you get up. You got to get up and go in. Ah, thank you, Jesus. And we have terminology a lot of church people do, talking about going in. You know, when we talk about going, we're like going into worship, getting in the presence of the Lord. Well, here the voice was telling him, get up and go into the city. You're going to Damascus, all right, but you're not going riding on a high horse. You're going humble and low. You're not going with your vicious plan. You're going to go and learn how to wait on me to get directions. And when you get there, I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You're not going in your own knowledge. Oh, I I feel that thing. Not going in your own strength. Not going in your own wisdom. Somebody ought to feel that. Someone ought to say, Lord, I made plans and they didn't work out. I made a schedule. I had all the designs of it. I had the, the markers. I put it down in, in, in my electronic device. And I had things that were going to happen this week and that week and that month. But God is saying to us, get up. Don't wallow in what's going. We can't even afford to wallow in the pandemic. We can't afford to wallow in the economic situation. We can't afford to be overly responsible, yes, but we can't wallow in the political divisions and derision. We have to still get a plan to move forward no matter what's happening. And so in the middle of this blinding light, he's lost his sight. He can't see. The voice says, get up and go in. And I'm saying to you, get up.
and go after what God has for you. Get up and go in, get those children, get that husband, get that wife, get those family members and begin to say, listen, we still have our faith. We're going to trust God and believe him. We're not going to be under the load and stuck in it, but we're going to get up from where we are, no matter what opposition and oppression still exists. And we're going to go into the presence of God. And whatever we do, whatever we have, we're going to do it, giving God praise and thanksgiving for it. He says, get up and go in but this time look you got to see this you got to get the spark of this text he doesn't go in like he was before I imagine he was just all big and puffed up and self-righteous he now is physically blind his spirit sight his spiritual sight has been pointed out as sightless he goes in the city being led by the hand okay it's easy going go in the city when you can see your way. I better make sure I don't bump into a bench. But he goes and he's led by the hand. What, is, what does that say to us, Bible students? It tells us that if we're really going to enter into the kingdom of God, we have to enter in, wow, as a child. Who do we take by the hand and help them cross the street? Who do we lead through crowds by the hand? Those that are young or those that are frail and elderly. He now goes in dependent depending. That's how we have to live our life, depending on the Lord. You know, I always hear these hymns when I'm talking, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. He is now led into the city, into Damascus. We won't get through all the text, but we're going to get through a good part of it. And uh, he says, you're going to find out what to do. So the men that are traveling with him, they get up and they're speechless. So everybody's changed. They heard the sound, but they didn't see. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and he didn't eat or he didn't drink. I don't know if he was formerly on a fast or if it was just so traumatic he had no desire to eat. But what I do know, because it comes to us in a later verse, he spent the time in prayer. I do know he was praying. I do know he was saying, Lord, I need some help here. I, I, I didn't know I was persecuting you. I believe it was a time of repentance. I believe it was a time of reorienting and refocus and redirection. That's why we have to do everything in prayer. And so when, when uh, he is there, those three days and he can't see, the Lord has a way uh, to help him and to bring him out. And so what the Lord did was he gave a vision. Let's see if I can find the verse here. He gave a vision to a certain disciple, verse 10 in Damascus, named Ananias. Uh, Ananias' name means uh, most gracious or graciousness. The Lord called to Ananias, I'm going to move a little quicker, in a vision. Uh, so here's the second vision. It says, Ananias... And Ananias is a devout disciple. He recognizes the voice of the Lord. It's like that third time Samuel went to Eli and he knew how God spoke. And so Ananias said, yes, Lord, he answered. Next verse. The Lord told him, go. God has a lot of goes, right? Go to the house of Judas, not the Judas you're thinking of, on Straight Street. Can you imagine living on Straight Street? Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I told you that's what Saul was doing. Now, Straight Street would be like, is it Regent Street in London? Or um, Michigan Avenue? Where's Michigan Avenue? In Chicago? Well, Fifth Avenue in New York. I know that one for sure. So I get you lost. It, it's the main thoroughfare. It runs east to west. And Ananias' house was believed to be on the west end of this big boulevard. And today there is what's considered, believed to be, Ananias' chapel. Uh, if we have a graph of that, we'll just show it to you. And now these are just stock pictures. They're not what one would see in that time. But it's to help you get a spark of the text. So there's a picture of what we are told is the chapel that has been put in this place where Ananias once was. Don't think it looked like that. Okay, thank you. So uh, God gives very specific instructions in verse 10 again to Ananias. He says, go, and I want you to, he tells him what street to go to. He tells him what house to go to. He tells him who's the owner of the house. He says, this man named Judas, he lives on straight streets. So you can't get lost. Very clear directions from the Lord. He said, and I want you 
to go, and there's going to be one of named Saul. Now, Saul's homeland was Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus. And he says, you're going to find him praying. I bet he was praying after what he went through. And he said, and he has seen in a vision that a man named Ananias would be coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So I'm sure Ananias said, oh, I'm glad he had a vision. I'm not just going in there unintroduced. Then Ananias answered the Lord. Now, don't be upset with him. He has an understandable hesitancy. He's talking back to the Lord. You and I would too. He said, wait a minute, let's have a sidebar. Let's see that script verse again. He said, I have heard many, not one, many reports, which means it's verifiable, that this man and all about this man and all the harm he has done to your people, not somebody else. I love the way Ananias puts it on the Lord. He's done many harmful things to your people, your holy people in Jerusalem. Verse 14, please. And he has come here and he has papers. He has authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. You see how he's putting it on the Lord? He said, these are your folks and they're calling on your name. Next verse, please. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. In other words, I, I understand all the details. You don't have to fill me in. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. One more verse. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, there's some jewels in this that are just important for us to see. So Ananias gets a vision, and he's told that Saul has also been given a vision, and that he is to go, and he's to lay hands on him so he can receive his sight. And Ananias is given a few explanations to the Lord, but when it's emphasized to him, he says, all right, I'm going. But the Lord makes it plain. He says he's a chosen vessel. We're a chosen and a world priesthood. I've set him aside. You know what came to me this week? We regularly pray in our house, and I'm sure you do too, thy kingdom come. And so I think when the kingdom come, there's going to be healing. That when the Lord's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, it's going to be peace, it's going to be some justice, relationships will be balanced, things will be stable. But now I'm starting to suspect, I've been praying about this several days, that when the kingdom comes, it doesn't necessarily look like we think it's going to look. That maybe sometimes that kingdom comes on earth in a low way, in a quiet way. It, let me give you a rough illustration. When I was an itinerant person and went from place to place, privileged to speak at different audiences, inevitably, if I was going on the weekend, before I left town on Thursday and Friday, one of my children would do something. I remember one occasion, the oldest boy, he might have been eight or nine, he just took his bike and rode into a tree, came in the house with his forehead nicked up, a big scar. It looked worse than it was, blood everywhere. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to get somewhere. I got a, a lesson to teach. I got a message to give. And this is just the enemy fighting for all these things happening. You know how it is when you want to really do something and you want to really do it for the Lord and the kingdom and all these interfering things start happening before you ever get to it? The thought that comes to me is the kingdom doesn't come when I hit the platform in those days and the audience seemed to receive the message. But the kingdom was really coming in subtle ways. Sometimes it comes in the suffering. Sometimes it comes in, in an unexpected joy or what looks like a failure. Because what my flesh is concerned about is success on the other end. But what I believe God is concerned about is being authentic. Because when the trouble comes and I go, oh Lord, I got to take care of this, I got to take this, and I hope I make the plane, and I hope I can remember what I'm supposed to do when I get there, then I go humble. I go praying. I go saying, Lord, I need you to get me through this. So maybe the kingdom is coming and it's often preparation for the things that's going to happen. Maybe Saul is suffering in a low, lonely, painful, humiliating, blind place in his life because it's getting him ready for the swift waters ahead. Maybe the trouble you're experiencing that we think is just interference is more preparation than just interference. Maybe that's already the Lord at work so that we'll be who he wants us to be when we get to the place he has called us to go. And so now Ananias does go uh, and he goes to the house and, he, and the Lord tells him, he says, he's my chosen vessel. And a chosen vessel, um, they say that the reason farmers in certain countries can produce enough food for 
masses of people is because they have better tools, better instruments. And what the Lord is saying is that Saul is a tool in my hand. He is my instrument. I'm going to use him. And he uses Saul. You know he does. You know how much of the Bible is written by Paul, we believe. You know the impact that he had. You know he went to the Jews first, but also to the Gentiles. You know he was a part of a great controversy because he went directly to Gentiles and he was criticized. You know that Paul went, Saul went through much uh, criticism and accusations because he didn't come to know the Lord the same way the other apostles did, that his apostleship was often questioned. And he had to say, but I encountered the Lord. I met him directly, that he had to be bold. He had to be assertive. He had to be faithful. He had to be prophetic and speak that lives would be saved when people all thought they would be lost. He had to endure persecution and injustice and still stay forward and starward and what God had given him to be. He was a chosen vessel. And the Lord said to bear my name before the Gentiles and before their kings and, and the children of Israel. And he said, and I will show him how great things. Okay, you think this is building up, right? Like I'm going to make his name famous through all generations. He says, I'm going to show him that he must suffer for my name's sake. Chosen to suffer. Chosen to suffer. So Ananias went, and was, we're going to breeze through this, and he entered the house and uh, he spoke and he told them uh, what the Lord had said. He said, the Lord sent me so that you might receive your sight. And verse 18, immediately scales fell from his eyes. Now, I can't tell you what the scales look like. Somebody has analogized it to uh, scales like scales on a fish. I don't know. None of it is a pretty picture to me. So I don't know. But whatever it was that was hiding his vision and clouding his vision, it fell off. Saul lays hands on him. Looks what happens. Look at what happened. The scales fell he received sight, he arose, he was baptized. And when you read the other scriptures, it also says that not only was he baptized, we believe in water, but that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you'll see that in, his, in Paul's own testimony about this event. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So he spent some time in fellowship there. Uh, and we don't know what happened on the occasion. Many people say, well, it was his receiving of the Holy Spirit uh, the same as what happened to some of the others in the book of Acts. We're not told in this text whether he had any other experience or evidence that made it normative that would suggest to us that this is the way Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. So I accept the scripture as it was. He was baptized, his sight, the miracle, his sight returned, uh, and he received the Holy Spirit. Now this is the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Saul, using the name Paul, which is the name he begins to prefer. Interesting enough, Paul means small, so he's no longer that big bad guy, right? But uh, interesting enough, Paul, so Paul is the one who teaches us uh, to discern and differentiate between the gift of the Holy Spirit as opposed to spiritual gifts. So we're told that he receives this gift of the Holy Spirit, which we believe is power for the witness and for the evangelism that he does. He receives his sight. Now he's not just a self-appointed wild man on the road. He spends time in fellowship. He spends time in fellowship and he preaches. He preaches on Jesus as the Son of God. Because he hasn't had time to learn a whole lot. But he knows he can preach that. And it's interesting that he would preach on the sonship of Jesus. Because in Judaism, son is one who is fully obedient to the father. And, and when you talk about sonship, you're talking about obedience. And he is understanding now the relationship between Jesus and the father. And so he preaches uh, on sonship. Let's see what else we want to emphasize here. He preached Christ in the synagogues. Uh, and he preached so much, verse 21 says, the people were amazed. One translation says they were astonished. Some said they were, uh, one translation says that word astonished means baffled. Another one says it means they were ecstatic. So in other words, it, they just couldn't make sense of it. This, this is just, this is a turnaround. Listen, these people were in a quandary. They didn't know what to make of what. This was the man who had been the hunter. And now God had arrested him. And because he is so subject now and captive, captivated and captive to the message of the good news of the gospel, the saving power of Jesus Christ, who is the Redeemer, he now himself becomes a victim of persecution. The persecutor becomes the prey. 
The hunter becomes hunted. He gets up to go in, but he goes in to learn the power of going through and learning what happens when one has to exist in the face of opposition. But God will not leave him without a witness. And so while he's there in Jerusalem, he preaches so until a plot comes to destroy him. There's this, I get in trouble when I try to remember these sayings, because it's not a particularly good saying, but it comes to mind. Uh, it's that if you want to, if you want to stop, if you want to, there's two things, I can only remember the second one. I think is if you want to stop an author, a, a good author from writing, you know it's good work when people want to burn the books, they don't want the truth given. And the parallel to that, they say, is if you want to stop a good preacher, it's when people don't want to hear the word, that that word is penetrating and making a difference. Well, Paul's, Saul's message, I'll begin to call him Paul now because he's changed. Paul's message is really having an impact. And so it brought conviction. It, it, it brought to life that people need to make a choice. And they wanted to destroy him. They wanted to get rid of him. And so now for a different reason, he's persecuted. And verse 22 said, as he went along in fellowship, he, he increased more and more. So they were confounded, the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So after many days, the Jews that were there, the ones that weren't believers, they took counsel to kill him. So you have a group that says, I don't know if he's really safe or not, because this is the man that harmed. You know, they could have known someone was orphaned because of Paul's work, or someone that was widowed because of Paul's cruelty. So there was mistrust by the believers. There were those that resented him that weren't followers of Christ. And then there were those who would have been part of an establishment that wouldn't want him to speak. And so uh, it says that the Jews took counsel. And it's not clear who they took counsel with. Some said they, they took counsel with those who were the government leaders, um, but they took counsel to kill him. And they laid in wait for him. They start watching him. Okay, this is really a big deal. He's gone from one side to the other. And the city had two big gates, colonnades, main highway, main boulevard. But the two ways to leave the town were by these big gates. They watched the gates day and night. In other words, he will not escape. But God had a way. Thank you, Jesus. He made a way of escape. And someone who was a believer had a house on the wall or they borrowed access to a house on the wall and they let him down out of a window. That's familiar, right? That's happened before. David went out of a window to escape. Uh, they let him out of a window in a basket. That word basket is more like, a, a, in our language, it would be more like a hamper. So it was able to be large enough even where wood could be loaded out. And so he came, he was headed in pompous. He didn't get there pompous, but he was headed in uh, to Damascus in a pompous attitude. But because he met God on the way, he leaves out under cover of night. He leaves out uh, in darkness. Uh, he, the midnight of his soul uh, was exposed to the light of Christ. And now, where he would have come in daring others, he has to slip out of town in a very humble way. And they took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Uh, and so um, he left Damascus, and then he went back to Jerusalem. And when he went there, I'll just tell this part to you, verse 26, he wanted to join with the disciples, the other believers, like, hey, guys, I'm changed. But they were afraid of him. He had such a reputation, they didn't believe that he really was a disciple. And so God always has somebody. And so there was Barnabas, verse 27. Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. And I want you to know that when you just feel like, hey, I couldn't make it over there, I couldn't make it over here, he's trying to find his people, y'all. He's trying to relate to people. He's been a lone wolf. Now he goes to Jerusalem and they're afraid of him there. And so Barnabas, whose name means sons of encouragement, let's look at that verse. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. I love this. He was an intercessor. He was a reconciler for him. He was an intermediary. That's what we need. Sometimes you need another believer to come alongside and help you. He took him. Now picture this. Stay with that verse a minute. Remember he was taken by the hand and led into the city? 
Now he has to be taken by the hand, as it were, and led into introduction to the apostles. So Barnabas, the son of encouragement, God sent somebody to encourage you, took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them this testimony. He said, listen, let me tell you about this man. He is changed. The Lord spoke to him on the Damascus road. He preached fearlessly in Damascus and he was with them and he told them all about it. And so he made a way for Saul, who later is called Paul, to be accepted into the community of believers. Because we can't do this thing alone. We talked about partnership. We have to be in community. And what did he do? He did what he had done in Damascus. He began to preach the gospel fearlessly. See, it had been three years since he was converted before he came back to Jerusalem. So that's a long time. And I can see people saying, well, if you changed so much, how come you haven't been here with the apostles? How come you so late just getting back to us? But the Lord sent him to various places in the interim before he came back to Jerusalem and he had to be received. And that's important because he didn't stay as a lone person. He was accepted into the fellowship. And sometimes we say, well, I heard from God. I'm going to do my own thing. Okay, granted, you may have heard, but there's some point at which we become a body of Christ and we have to come into the fellowship of, and the family of faith and of believers and work collaboratively together. So now he's received there in Jerusalem. Um, we have a demonstration for you, so I want you to prepare for that. And the demonstration that we want to share is how God can really work a change in our life and uh, he preached so in Jerusalem until uh, people got envious there all over again. And they had to slip him out of Jerusalem. Let's see if I can find where it is. I know they sent him to Caesarea. Verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Uh, then, final verse, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort, that sounds good. I'm reading from a different translation. Let me read it from the NIV. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. That's what God can do. Total time of trouble and heartache, but then God gave them a season of peace. Peace because one of the, the worst persecutors was no longer persecuting. Uh, he had stopped doing what he was doing. I'm going to invite you now um, to see and to share with us uh, a demonstration of how God can change. I said in the beginning that this lesson was for those who felt like they were at their end. Not only their wits end, but just desperate for God to move. And not only do we want him to give us a sight and our heart, open the eyes of my heart, but I want to remind you of a song that was popularized a while back that just says, a change has come over me. Saul made a great change, a great change. And I want to ask you that question today. Christ is the one who is the hunter, not us. Christ is the one who is the initiator. He's the one that brings us to our knees and wants to acknowledge who he wants to be in our life because we need him. And if you're there, if you're here, if we're together, and if you've come like Saul had to do to the end of yourself, you just don't have it in you and you recognize that it's in him, then I'm going to invite you to identify with the change that God made. And I'm going to say taking him from Saul to Paul. We're not told that that's why his name was changed, but that'll help us to see the differentiation. From night to day, from harsh to meek, from self-righteous to considerate, a change was made in his life. And so if you've been brought to the end of your resources, I'm going to say to you today, get up so you can go into the presence of the Lord. I'm going to say, give up so you can give in to what God has planned for you. And I'm going to invite you to share this just very simple presentation, but I'm gonna ask you to share it with us prayerfully and think about the change that Christ can make and will make in your life. A change has come over me. From hunter to the hunted, 
Paul the hunter. Paul the hunter was one of blind heat, wicked zeal, a brutal, cruel man. He was untamed in his passions. He was an unbridled beast, rough, rampaging, wild, fierce in his cruelty. He was implacable. Nothing could stop him and soothe him. He was enraged, a self-appointed exterminator, spent on terrorizing the people of God, a man who wanted slaughter, who breathed out threatenings and murder, intimidating, violent, frightening, a raging war horse. This was the hunter. But our God can work a change, a change on a Damascus road. Our Damascus roads may not look alike. They may look differently. And I don't know what your Damascus road looks like, but let me tell you what God can do for you as he did for Saul. He redirected his energies. He now was a man that did not find all wisdom in himself but he come, came to know the knowledge of God. He understood that he was unworthy of the love and grace that God shared with him. And he was led now, not brutal, not violent, not wicked, unbridled zeal, but he was led like a child. Reminds us of the master who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Not in his own power. No, 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 not, not in his own might, not, not even in his own strength but open to the plan of God, open to kinship and fellowship with the saints, open to collaboration and community in need, learning what it is to have one another. Formerly the hunter, but now he's listening for God's direction, sensitive to his whisper, not rough and wild, reposed, quiet, prayerfully in retreat, calm, inquisitive, Lord, what would you have me to do? Not his old self, his former self was the hunter. The hunter was pompous puffed up, arrogant, stiff-necked, proud, chest pushed out, impressed with his own credentials, Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee, learned of the tribe of Benjamin, reputation to uphold. He, and only he, knew best. He was pleased with himself, self-absorbed, self-appointed, self-credentialed, and with a false authority that couldn't stand the test. Self-willed, <laughs> thinking he could do it on his own, independent. He was callous, not concerned about others, just self-righteous. He was bigoted, and his God was a distant, punitive God. But he went from the hunter to being hunted by a loving God. A change, a change came over him. A change that the song says, he washed away my sins. And Saul becoming Paul was made whole again. A wonderful change can come not only to him, but to you. And a wonderful change has been reserved for me. And we too can be changed and our life can be complete. And so now this Saul becomes a disciple. 
This Saul knows that he has a God who is intimate, who is caring, who pursues him, who chases him down, who follows him, who creeps into his midnight and dries his eyes and soothes his brow. He has a God now who is personal, who is intimate, who sends the Holy Spirit as a paraclete, who says, I'll never leave you alone. I won't abandon you. I care about you because you are my child and I will make ways for you. Trust me. Saturate yourself in prayer. Access the daily grace. This, this Paul, this new man, this changed man, his heart is daily assaulted by the grace of God. His life is peppered and seasoned and flavored by an indescribable love. A change has come over him. Pride is broken. His God is vulnerable because he can be touched by the feeling of his infirmities. His God. His God. His God is our God. His God will be our God even until the end. His God is an infinite God. His God will never leave us, never forsake us, never abandon us. His God brings about a change and a conversion. First Timothy, we have a screen for the scripture explains what conversion is. 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 17. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Paul said, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. He said, what I did, I did it in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Listen, it doesn't matter if you're a blasphemer. It doesn't matter if you have been found guilty when you're innocent. It matters on one level, but it doesn't matter in terms of keeping you away from the grace of God. He is yet ready to pour that grace on our lives. And in that same passage, Paul said in verse 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He said, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. That same patience is waiting for you. That same patience, I can access it. It's here now. I know many of you are believers, but sometimes you feel like this circumstance, this season, it's just getting the best of me. But God is eager to show mercy to us. Acts 9, verse 6 and 8. Now get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. The results of conversion for Paul are the same results of conversion for us. And we can show that to you in a graph. The results of his conversion was that he had faith in the Savior. The results of conversion was that there was fervency in prayer. And not only was there, that's the five stages of conversion. I'll, since that is up, I'll share that with you. The stages of conversion was first he had contact on the Damascus road. He was convicted and he asked the Lord to identify himself. He was converted and he had a change. And then he had some days where he was just put away in retreat of consecration. And he developed a communion with the Lord. And then the results of these stages of his conversion was that he had faith in the Savior now. He was willing to preach about Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He was fervent in prayer. Prayer was the hallmark of the rest of his career and his ministry. He was faithful in service. He was consistent and durable. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had fellowship with the saints. 
He was eager and profound, and he grew more and more and fervent in his speaking so that his words were persuasive. And yes, the inescapable, he was fearless in suffering for the cause of Christ. Listen, these same things have happened and are happening in our life. A miracle is waiting right in our everyday circumstances for you and for me. And so I'm asking you, have you come to the end? If you have, there's an answer. Give up what you've been holding on to and give in so God can fill you and bless you. Our Damascus Road, for sure, it's less dramatic. I'm glad for that than what Paul experienced. But even so, it's designed to break our compulsiveness to be independent, to break our, our desire to go it alone, to do it our way. Our Damascus Road will take the puff and the arrogance out of us, men and women alike. Because Saul was looking for men and women to bind, and the adversary, the Satan that comes after us, he doesn't care about the gender, he's just after our souls. He wants to bind us and restrict us and destroy us. But the arrogance comes out, and the Word of God will bring us to Christ, who is all of our salvation. The Damascus Road was not only a place of conversion, it was a place of deliverance. It was a place of reconcentration, reconsecration for God's chosen instruments and for his servants. Saul gladly proclaimed the rest of his life, and he marveled at the splendorous grace of God. A change, a change has come over me, and a change can come over you. Let's pray together. Father, we receive now into our hearts where our eyes have been open. We receive into our mind where our thinking has been upgraded. We receive into our hands to do the work that you have for us to do and the path where you would have us to walk and the life that you would desire that we live. We, we receive it now by that same grace not a different formula, but the same grace that was poured into Saul. Vicious Saul, voracious in his punitiveness. You can help us, whatever our situation is. In the shadow of Mount Zion, where Moses received the law, Paul received grace. In the shadow of whatever looms big and monumental in our life, you don't come to punish us, but you come to give us grace in the time of our need. And God, I am so thankful for it. I am so grateful that you had mercy. Saul said he was the worst of sinners, but if the truth be told, I could give him some competition. But yet you are forgiving and a loving and saving God. And so wherever you are, I invite you to receive the change that's immediate. Some changes were waiting for legislation. Some changes were waiting for someone to authorize an executive order or pass a bill or change a local ordinance or, or doors to be open or schools to be closed. But this is a change that is readily available to us because Christ has paid the price. You may be seated. You may be standing. Whatever position you're in, let your inner man stand up. Let the arms of your heart be open to receive what God has. Father, pour that grace in on us right now. Shine the light of your glory and your word on hearts. In a dark place, in a dim place, in a place that feels like a cave, where people feel shut in and locked out, show up right now, God. Interrupt everything and you become the main center of what's going on in our life. Let everything revolve around your word and your plan for us. And let us know that we're not helpless. Let us know that we are not without power, but we are empowered and enabled by you. You are, hallelujah, you are our Barnabas. Your Holy Spirit has come to encourage us. You're the one that introduces us. You're the one that takes our petitions to the Father. You're the one that leads us and guides us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. You're the one that brings us into fellowship and kinship. And you're the one that brings brings us into the family of God and is as our elder brother. And God, there is no one like you anywhere. And we're not ashamed of this gospel. 
This word has come to those that felt desperate. This word has come to someone who was at the end. This word has come to someone who was just about to their Damascus, intending to do something that they really should not have done or entertain a thought that was not intended to be entertained. This is the end of our Bible study tonight. And this is the word of the Lord. From Hunter to hunted by God. He's pursuing you. He wants you. And give your life to him. Amen.